Hello, this is Zach Chalkin, IRB Administrator, and this is Pursuing a Waiver or Alteration of Consent. This presentation has been approved by the University of Buffalo IRB and is part of the Clinical and Translational Science Institute's educational series. Today's topics include defining what is informed consent, describing what the differences are between a waiver of consent and alterations of consent, situations when waivers or alterations of consent are appropriate and approvable, and how to request a waiver or alteration of consent from the IRB. So what is informed consent? Informed consent is a focal way that researchers take in meeting the Belmont principle of respect for persons. The consent process provides information about the research to the research participants. It ensures comprehension of all aspects of the research study by the prospective participant, and the consent process being informed ensures that consent is voluntary by the research participant. Federal regulations require that investigators obtain consent from participants or their legally authorized representatives for human subjects research. The regulations also require that the process must be documented. There is another presentation about informed consent that you will be able to look up as part of the educational series. Although that was a brief definition of informed consent, we will move into what are waivers and alterations of consent. A simplified definition of a waiver of consent is when the subjects who are included in the study are not consented. This could be for participants who are participating in the study actively or for retrospective chart review studies as an example where there will be no interactions with research subjects. An altered consent process means that consent is obtained. However, there is a change in the process in which some, but not all of the usually required elements of consent are removed. A waiver of documentation of consent means that the participant is consented during the consent process. However, a signature is not required and not completed as part of the process. If your research study turns out to be an exempt study, there are separate requirements for the consent process, and those can be found on the HRP 312 exempt worksheet. The requirements for exempt research consents are much shorter and much less intensive than for expedited level studies or for greater than minimal risk studies. For those non-exempt studies that are either expedited or greater than minimal risk, the researcher can request a waiver or alteration of consent or the consent process by providing a justification in the HRP 503 protocol document. However, only the IRB can make the determination if a waiver or alteration of consent is appropriate. So when would a waiver or alteration of the consent process be appropriate? The next several slides will talk about a few specific examples and other determinations that the IRB has to make. One common guideline for requesting a waiver or alteration of consent is that the research study should not adversely affect the subject's rights or their welfare in order to participate. And although this is not an exhaustive list, this slide does show a few examples of when a waiver or alteration of consent would be approved or appropriate from the IRB. The most common case for an alteration of consent would be a deception or incomplete disclosure study. These types of studies usually take place because the participant cannot know all of the details of the study as part of the consent process in order to not bias the potential data collection. In these cases, any important information that is not included in the consent should be made available after participation in some type of debriefing situation, and this debriefing document should be uploaded into the IRB submission. The study could offer the option of removing subject data after the debrief if the participant does not want their data to be, remain as part of the study. 
for some studies that include a waiver of consent where the IRB can approve the waiver. The most common ones are retrospective studies for data that has previously been collected, studies where the research data is publicly available, or for public behavior observation of large groups of people. Some conditions where the IRB may consider a waiver or alteration of consent could be potential methodological issues of the study, or if there is potential consent bias. An example of a methodological issue could be for an epidemiology study where a full sample is needed in order to establish the prevalence of certain conditions. An example of a study that may include consent bias would be for those who hold more socially accepted views on a subject may be more likely to participate in research on that topic than those who know that their views are not as popular as the other topic. Emergency research is a special type of research altogether, and it does include the potential to have a waiver of consent involved. However, it is a much larger topic and it is very rare to occur at the university. An example of emergency research is if a patient is in a life-threatening situation, current treatment is ineffective, and obtaining consent is not feasible, and the research intervention could directly benefit the patient. However, in this type of situation, consent should still be obtained as soon as possible, if it is possible. The participant or their legally authorized representative can still withdraw even after the emergency treatment, refusing to allow any of their data from that treatment to be used for research data. The next several slides will all talk about how to request a waiver or alteration of consent from the IRB, either in the HRP 503 protocol document or from re referencing the HRP 410 waiver or alteration of consent checklist. If it seems that a waiver or alteration of consent would be appropriate for your study, the justification for the request must be provided in the HRP 503 protocol document. The process for requesting the waiver of consent process, the waiver of documentation of consent, and other alterations of consent all differ from one another, and they require special attention to sections 28 to 30 of the HRP 503, which we will go into more detail in the next several slides. First, we will focus on this, the waiver of consent process. Section 28 of the HRP 503 protocol document is the consent process section. If you intend to not obtain consent at all, you will check the no box in this section and skip all the way then to section 29. Section 29 is the waiver or alteration of consent process section. If you are planning on waiving consent, you will uncheck the not applicable box, which is in this section. If you intend to waive consent, you must provide a justification for requesting the waiver of consent in the text box below. The HRP 410 waiver of or alteration of consent checklist should be referenced and looked at by the researcher or study team in order to provide an appropriate answer in this text box. The IRB reviewers will be using this checklist in order to be able to grant the waiver or alteration of consent. Please look at this checklist and insert an answer in section 29.1 that accounts for all of the criteria in that particular section that you will be using. Section 29.2 is only for emergency research, and if you are requesting a waiver of the consent process for emergency research. This very rarely occurs, so you would likely choose not applicable in this section. Then when you move on to section 30, which is the process to document consent, you would check the NA box, not applicable, as you are waiving consent for your study. Submitting for an alteration of consent process is handled a little bit differently since you actually are obtaining consent as opposed to the waiver of consent part. However, the same section will be filled out in the HRP 503 protocol. The two most common alterations to the consent process would be withholding the true purpose of the research study in the consent form, or also not disclosing all of the study procedures in the consent form. 
The reason for doing these things is to prevent potential bias from the research participant while they are taking part in the study. During the IRB review process, IRB administrators will be using the HRP 314 criteria for approval document. The consent will be compared against item 8, which is the elements of consent disclosure, to verify that all required elements of consent are disclosed. This is where the process gets a little different when completing the HRP 503 protocol. You will be obtaining consent whenever you're asking for an alteration of consent, so you must check the yes option in section 28.1 and then complete any relevant sections from 28.2 to 28.18. Sections 28.2 to 28.5 will be completed for every single study, whereas all the subsequent subsections all deal with specialized populations. When you get to section 29 and section subsection 29.1, if, if the research involves an alteration of the consent process, you must provide your justification for requesting the changes to the elements of consent. This is similar to what would happen for the waiver of consent, but you also must include a debriefing process in your answer. All the same criteria must be true for a waiver of consent as it would be for an alteration of consent, as the checklist is the same in the HRP 410. Just as in the previous example, subsection 29.2 only involves emergency research, so you can enter not applicable into that section unless emergency research is being used. For section 30.1, since you are actually obtaining consent, you will likely be choosing the box that says we will be following SOP, Written Documentation of Consent, HRP 091. Now we will shift gears to talking about the waiver of written documentation of consent and cases when a waiver of documentation of consent would be appropriate. The HRP 411 Waiver of Written Documentation of Consent Checklist is the guideline that IRB administrators use when determining whether or not a waiver of written documentation of consent can be approved for your study. Some examples of when a waiver of written documentation of consent may be appropriate would be cases for a minimal risk study where having a signature on a consent document is the only record that links that participant to that study and the main risk of the study is a breach of confidentiality. Studies in which the researcher does not have any actual contact with the subjects, for example, studies that take place completely online with different types of surveys. Studies where participants are members of a community or cultural group where it is not normal to sign documents such as a consent form. Another type of example could be when study procedures are not ones for which consent is normally required, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a future slide. And also, if signing a document connects someone with a marginalized or stigmatized group that would otherwise wouldn't be known or could adversely affect them or their well-being. For example, a study involving illicit drug users, sex workers, victims of domestic abuse, or other similar examples. Please keep in mind that researchers should still use appropriate methods for documenting that informed consent was obtained from that participant, even if a signature is not used. In many cases, the IRB may still require that a written statement of the research is provided to the subjects and researchers can provide a written consent form that does not include a signature page. A common misconception of what we see at the IRB, especially with no greater than minimal risk studies, is the confusion of waiving consent and waiving a signature for consent. Please understand that a waiver of written documentation of consent does not mean a waiver of the consent process. If you are obtaining consent, you must still complete the consent process section and check NA for the waiver of consent section. And then you can put in an answer in section 30 of the protocol, which we will show shortly in another slide. Some cases when documentation of consent cannot be waived would be when a signature is required 
outside of the research context for this activity. A good example of this is HIPAA authorization, as HIPAA always requires a signature. So if medical records are being looked at at all, or if da study data is going into a medical record, the study consent form must include a HIPAA authorization and a signature must be obtained. Another example could be from the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, otherwise known as FERPA, except under limited circumstances. And then you can review the HRP 331 FERPA work compliance worksheet. This is available in the Click Library. Similar to the prior examples when talking about the waiver or alteration of consent process, now we will look at where in the HRP 503 protocol to answer questions about a waiver of written documentation of consent. Since you are obtaining consent, even if there is no signature on the consent form, you must complete the consent process section of the HRP 503 protocol, which is section 28 in its entirety for whatever sections are relevant for your particular study. In section 29, if consent will not be obtained, that is when you check the not applicable box for the waiver of consent process section. As described earlier, waiving documentation of consent is not an alteration of consent. And if the study does involve other alterations as listed above, like info not being disclosed or deception, please provide a justification for requesting these changes to the elements of consent. A study could possibly have both an alteration of consent and a waiver of written documentation of consent in the same study. Section 29.2 again is emergency research and can likely be not applicable for your study. However, section 30 is the, the documentation of consent process section. If you plan to waive written documentation of consent, please review the HRP 411 waiver of written documentation of consent checklist and provide a description and justification for why you would like to waive written documentation of consent in your answer to the section. As a final reminder, if you are unsure if your research would fall into one of the categories discussed, please review the HRP 410 waiver of consent checklist or the HRP 411 waiver written documentation of consent checklist, and both are available in the CLIC library under the checklist tab. You can always contact the IRB or the clinical research office with any questions as well. Thank you for your time and attention during this presentation. If you have any questions, you can contact Valerie Bellani in the UBIRB helpline at ub-irb at buffalo.edu or phone number 716-888-4888. You can also contact me at 716-888-4874. You can also contact the CTSI clinical research facilitators, Marshall Brooks or Alexis O'Brien, and their phone number is 716-829-4357.